Well, hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Ash. I'm one of the pastors of City Church Bristol. And uh, over the past few weeks, we've been exploring who Jesus is. We have heard Jesus with his own words. And uh, these words that we've reflected on over the past few weeks were written by a man called John. John was a friend of Jesus. And uh, John wrote an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. John saw many of the things that Jesus did, many of the miracles. Uh, he would have witnessed many of the conversations that Jesus had. He would have heard many of his sermons and he, he put a few of them into uh, what we now know as John's gospel. And John actually said that, well, you know, if, if you were to write down everything that Jesus said and did, there would be so much stuff there that even the entire world wouldn't have enough space to contain the books that could be filled. So there is much that can be said about Jesus. But more importantly, at the end of his account, John says these words. This is in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John's hope, his expectation in writing this account is that we would see something of Jesus and we would be led to believe in him. And the result of our belief would be that we would ultimately have full and complete eternal life. That is John's intention with the words that he has written. And the way that John does it is that he, he, he leads us to belief in Jesus by painting for us a few portraits, really, of Jesus, a few sketches of things that he said and things that he did. So Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Now, those who see Jesus truly as the bread of life, those who uh, put their trust in him, express that belief in making him their deepest satisfaction. So Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Those who truly see him as the light of the world, those who put their trust in him, those who believe in him, express that belief in looking to him and listening to him. Jesus said, I am the door for the sheep. Those who truly see him as the door, those who believe in him, express that belief in him by entrusting their protection to him, entrusting themselves to his protection. And today, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Now, at this stage, Jesus has had a, an extended conversation with the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Um, I say a conversation, really, it was a confrontation. It was, it was quite robust language used on either side. Things were, were getting quite heated. And Jesus had made some bold statements about himself. He had made statements that really uh, fall nothing short of him claiming to be the son of God. But not only did he claim to be the son of God, the statements really were also a, a bit of a, um, a challenge to these religious leaders, these people who opposed Jesus. And now, Jesus says in, in John chapter 10, he says this. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Well, there we find, um, as is often the case, Jesus is using imagery and metaphor. It's imagery and metaphor to help us to understand really what he is like. So he's telling us something about himself. He's telling us something about ourselves. And he's also telling us something about how the two relate. So what is it that Jesus is showing us here in this particular passage? Well, there is language, isn't there, of, of sheep and of shepherds, of hired hands, of, of wolves. And... Um, you know, this, this, this language of sheep and shepherds, um, I, I grew up in London, um, I didn't encounter many sheep 
growing up. Um, I have since then, uh, but they were not a regular part of life for me. And um, often as we approach the, the Bible, we will encounter um, settings, uh, sights, sounds, uh, language, which may be a little bit unfamiliar to us. And one of the dangers can be when we find uh, a, a language or themes that are, are unfamiliar to our everyday life, there is a danger that we can begin to discount what is said. Or we can maybe see it as irrelevant or very distant, has nothing to say to me here today. But on the flip side, there is a danger of over familiarity. There is a danger of me assuming that, well, I completely understand the context and the settings and the situations. and That can often lead to misunderstanding what is being said. Either way is a bit of an extreme that we don't want to venture into. Now, I want to encourage us all. I want to encourage us all and say that the Bible is valuable, it is relevant and it is powerful. All of it from cover to cover, the bits that we like and the bits that we don't like. God has something to say to us in the entirety of the Bible. And the Bible, it's like, um, it's like gold, it's like mining for gold. It, it takes work, it takes effort, but it is absolutely worth it. Because if we get to understand the Bible, then we get to understand God. We get to know God himself. He speaks by the Bible. So in order for us to understand who God is, we need to handle the Bible well. And in this particular case, what we want to do is we want to um, just for a few moments, just stop and slow down. And we actually want to enter into the sights, the sounds and the smells of 2000 years ago, the setting in which we find this particular passage. We want to wind the clock back and we want to want to ask, what was it that these words actually meant to those who first heard them or those who first read them? We want to see through their eyes. We want to hear through their ears. And once we've done the work of entering into that, that setting and that context, once we've asked the questions about what it would have meant to them, we then come back into our worlds and consider what does that mean for us today? How does that apply to us today? And that's exactly what we're going to do with this passage. It's, it's what we should do with every passage of the Bible. So let's enter into that world. So we have uh, shepherds, sheep, hired hands and wolves. Let's think about the shepherds for a few moments. Now, in the ancient world, shepherds were known uh, to be those who cared for sheep, those who uh, led sheep, those who protected sheep. A shepherd was a, a known figure in the ancient world, a world where many people worked in agriculture, worked with livestock. But for the Jewish people in particular, and let's bear in mind that the first hearers of these words were Jewish, for the Jewish people in particular, shepherd was often used as a metaphor for leaders or leadership. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, when we read the words from some of the prophets, we'll often hear reference to shepherds. More often than not, that is, that is a metaphor for leaders, those who lead the people. So we have shepherds. We also have hired hands in this passage. And these are distinct from the shepherds. These people were hired to look after the sheep. Uh, maybe they would watch the sheep pen overnight. They would often um, uh, look over the sheep and they would wait for the shepherd to return. When the shepherd returned, the, the hired hand would open the gate and the sheep would walk out and be led out by the shepherd. So we have shepherds, we have hired hands, we have sheep. And, you know, this begs the question, we've got, we've got shepherds, we've got hired hands. Why is it that these sheep need so much looking after? Well, I think there are two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that sheep are pretty defenceless. They have no um, offensive weaponry at their disposal. Now, I told you before, I didn't, I didn't grow up around uh, many sheep. I've encountered sheep um, since growing up and leaving London. And a number of years ago, um, I encountered not just one sheep, but many sheep. And I was actually quite scared, to be honest. I'm, it was quite unfamiliar uh, with this, uh, this fluffy, uh, bleating animal. And to be honest, there were quite a few of them, and I was quite scared. And then I just stopped for a few moments and thought, why on earth am I scared? What on earth can a sheep 
do to me? Not very much. So the reason we have shepherds and hired hands is because sheep are defenseless. They need protection. They need leadership. They need feeding. They Sheep are defenseless. But not only that, there are also predators out there. There were those who would seek to devour the sheep. And that's where the wolves come in. Wolves made a habit of coming after the after the sheep in the hope of having a a meal essentially okay so we have shepherds hired hands we have sheep and we have wolves so these are the four characters in Jesus's play but let's just step back for a few moments and have a look at the setting that Jesus himself finds himself in now it's actually a little bit like a, a general election debate if you think about a general election debate, oftentimes you would have uh, the candidates in the room. You would have members of the public also in the room, in the audience. And uh, you would also have people watching in from outside, watching at home on TV. And actually, at this stage in the life of Jesus, it's almost like he's in general election debate territory. OK, so Jesus, he's made some bold claims uh, about himself in the previous few years. He's essentially claimed to be the son of God. He's also claimed that he's bringing this thing called the kingdom of God, this amazing, glorious, uh, magnificent government that will know no end and has unlimited scope. So he's made some grand claims about himself and how people ought to respond to him. And you know, this, this setting, this, this scenario, is, it's almost like, again, it's like a, a general election debate and you've got Jesus put on the spot by the Pharisees, these religious leaders, and they are peppering him with questions and they're trying to back him into a corner. They're trying to make him trip up in his words or, 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 or say something out of place. You see, the, 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 the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they, these are the ones who are in power at the moment and they do not want to give up power. They are challenged and threatened by the things that Jesus is saying. And Jesus often comes after these religious leaders. So these Pharisees are putting him on the spot, asking question after question after question, not really wanting to know what he has to say. They're just trying to trip him up. So you've got the Pharisees in the room asking questions. You've also got a few other people around who would be listening in intently. They might be there listening and just, just wondering, OK, is this Jesus the real deal? Is he able to deliver on what he says? But then you, you've also got, I suppose, some people who are slightly more removed. And that, that would be us. Like in the, the general election debate, you, you've got people watching on TV. We are, we are that one step removed from the Pharisees and from the other uh, Jewish people in the passage. We are looking in from the outside. And just imagine again, imagine the scenario for a few moments. The question comes up. Why are you the best person for the job? Jesus responds. I am the good shepherd. Now that is technically what is known as a mic drop moment. Uh, you know, some of you, I, I um, have watched many films and many drama series where um, there's a there's a there's a really intense plot twist at some time. So the story is going in a particular direction. Someone says something or does something that is a complete surprise. And what's the response? Well, my mouth is wide open. I, I can't believe what I've just seen. I don't know how to respond to it in my mind. I'm trying to make sense of what has just happened. I believe that. What we have here in this passage is a bit of a mic drop moment for those who are gathered around Jesus. Their mouths are open. And maybe by the time they got round to closing their mouths again, they might have nudged each other and said, well, um, hold on, did, did Jesus actually say that? If I heard correctly here, he has just made a huge, massive statement. But why is it such a mic drop moment? Well, I think there are, there are two prime reasons why I say this. It's, it's Jesus really is talking about, this is about who he claims to be and what he claims to do. So let's look for a few moments at uh, who Jesus claims to be. 
Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. Not only a shepherd, not only a leader among many. The people have experienced many leaders over the years, good and bad. Jesus is not putting himself into that bracket of general leader, general good person. He is saying, I am the good shepherd. I am the true shepherd. I am the perfect shepherd. I am the definition of shepherd, of leader. So as Jesus says these words, he says, I am the good shepherd, that the Jewish people gathered there, some of them would have thought, you know what? It, this sounds really familiar. This is taking my mind back somewhere. And for many of them gathered who would have known their Old Testament fairly well, they would have thought back for a moment and thought, you know what? This reminds me of something from the prophet Ezekiel. This reminds me of something that Ezekiel said. It reminds me of a time where actually, well, through the mouth of Ezekiel, God was speaking and God was berating the shepherds. God was basically um, telling the, the, the leaders of the time, leaders of the people of the time, that they were not doing a good job. They were not leading faithfully. God was speaking very strongly to them. But then in Ezekiel chapter 34, we read this. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day on a day of clouds and thick darkness. So they would have their minds would have gone back to those words, but then they would have stopped again and thought, it reminds me of something else. Something else came through the mouth of one of the other prophets, someone called Jeremiah. And maybe their minds would have turned to Jeremiah 23. And again, God is berating the shepherds. He has harsh words for the leaders of the time. And in Jeremiah chapter 23, he says this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. So Jesus, his words, him describing himself as the, the good shepherd, would have taken the minds of the people back to the Old Testament. They would have known exactly what he was talking about. Jesus in saying, I am the good shepherd, is claiming to be the perfect promised leader sent from God, God's own son. He is laying out his credentials. He is essentially saying there is no one better to lead you. This is why I am the best person for the job. But not only that, it's not just about who he claims to be. It's also about what he claims to do. So he's laid out his credentials. What about his plan? Well, in verse 11, we read that the, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, this is not what we, we regularly expect from leaders, is it? We don't expect, you know, in whatever form, a leader to say, well, I'm going to lead by laying down my life. It sounds a wonderful sentiment, doesn't it? It sounds loving and caring, but it, it begs the question, how is this helpful? How is this beneficial? Because surely if a shepherd loses their life, the sheep are in greater danger. I've just said that sheep are defenseless. Well, sheep without a shepherd are in significant danger. So why does Jesus say that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep? How is this beneficial? Well, we'll actually see as we progress through the passage. You know, in, in, in uh, debates, particularly political debates, often answers can be fairly woolly or vague. And oftentimes after a, a politician is, is asked a question and answers the question, there is a need for further questions to clarify a point, to make things clearer. 
And it's almost as though in this scenario, Jesus anticipates the need for greater clarity. And he brings greater clarity. It's like he, 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 he focuses the lens on himself. If in telling them that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life, if that is not enough, he goes a little bit further. You see, what Jesus does is wonderful, and it's, it's actually quite common throughout the Bible, um, where he, he, he really, he's doing a bit of compare and contrast. He's saying, on the one hand, this is who I am. On the other hand, this is who I am not. This is who I am. I am the good shepherd. This is who I am not, the hired hand. So let's think for a few moments about who Jesus is not. We're told that the hired hand uh, does not own the sheep. That's in verse 12. We're told that the hired hand doesn't care about the sheep. Verse 13. And it's important for us to realise that this is, Jesus is not making a judgment about hired hands. He is, he's using this imagery. He's using this language really to make a distinction. To set an example. And you know, we can, we can often think of God in very vague and very general terms, which I think does not serve us very well. God is not a vague and general God. He has spoken about himself. He says some definitive things about himself. And in fact, if you want to know God, the best place to start, and in fact, the place to finish, is by looking at Jesus. What does Jesus say and do? You see, in what he says and does, Jesus demonstrates what God is like and what God is not like. Now, a God that has no real interest or no real care for his people is not the God of the Bible. And I think that's what Jesus is getting at here. He's distinguishing himself as the good shepherd as separate from the, from the hired hand. And if we are ever tempted to, to think of God as being like a hired hand, as, as someone who doesn't really care for us, isn't really interested in us, Jesus says it couldn't be further from the truth. I am the good shepherd. So he is not the hired hand. That's not who he is. Let's think about what he doesn't do. Uh, one of my favourite books and actually favourite films of all time is The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. And it features uh, a group of uh, men and elves, dwarves and hobbits and wizards and, and many, many other. But these guys are a group and they're on a quest. It's a grand quest. And they find themselves deep in underground mines. And these underground mines have been overrun by some enemies of theirs. And they are being attacked and pursued. And so they are trying to get out of the mines. They're trying to get to, to safety. They're trying to get to daylight, essentially. And they're actually doing fairly well. They are holding their own. They're, they're looking, it's looking fairly promising. Um, but then something happens. There is a sound. And after the sound, the enemies who had been pursuing them, in fact, begin to flee. Why do they flee? They flee because, in fact, there is another enemy down there, one who is much more scary and vicious and grim than they are. And Gandalf is the, is the wizard. He's essentially like the shepherd of this group. He is their leader. And Gandalf knows exactly what's coming. Gandalf knows who this enemy is. It is the Balrog of Morgoth. And Balrog, uh, sorry, Bal Gandalf turns to his friends, turns to those that he's leading, and he says to them, this foe is beyond you. Gandalf knows that as well as they have done so far on the mission, on the quest, as many enemies as they have defeated, this foe is beyond them. They do not have the power or the ability to resist the Balrog. And he says to them, run, run for your lives. Keep on going, complete the mission. But the interesting thing is that Gandalf himself does not run. He stays. You know, in the passage, the hired hand would run. The hired hand would say, well, it's every person for themselves. I was just in it for the money. OK, now my life is in danger. I am off. I am going. Gandalf is not that guy. Gandalf stands his ground. Gandalf, in fact, knows by standing his ground, he is essentially giving up his life for the benefit of others so that they can get to where they need to be. Gandalf stands his ground in front of the Balrog and says, you shall not pass. Whatever it takes, 
Gandalf will ensure that the fellowship get to where they need to go. He shall not run. And just like Gandalf is not that guy to run, he's not the hired hand, Jesus is not that guy. He is not the hired hand. And in fact, just like Gandalf, Jesus puts himself in between uh, the enemy and those that he leads. He puts himself slap bang in the middle. Now, our great enemy is Satan. He is described as the accuser in the Bible. And in God's courtroom, he presents a long list of charges against me. So every word, every harsh word that I've spoken, every time that I've lied, every time that I've inflicted uh, pain or sadness on someone else, every time where I've been more interested in my own comfort, my own honour, my own glory than the, the, the comfort and the, and the good of others, every time when I've thought that really the, the world essentially revolves around me rather than God, every single time there is a long list of charges against me and Satan himself accuses me in God's courtroom. And over me there is a guilty verdict. I cannot plead not guilty. I am absolutely guilty as charged. So there's over me a guilty verdict. But there is also over me a sentence of eternal torment. Now, if we just back up for a few moments and we'll think about the shepherd, we'll think about the, the leader again. Leaders get us to where we need to be. I think that's true. And um, I said shepherds are, uh, uses the Bible to, as a metaphor for leaders. And we as people are sheep. We're described as sheep as defenceless uh, with predators out to get us. Well, as sheep, we have willfully walked into danger. We have walked into danger that we are unable to get ourselves out from. But the good shepherd does not intend for us to remain there. The good shepherd does not intend for me to remain with a guilty verdict over me. He does not intend for me to suffer eternal torment. The good shepherd intends for me to have life and life in its fullness. Now, the way that the good shepherd gets me, gets us there, is in fact by giving his own life for mine. That's why he says the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You see, what happens is he stands in the place so that wolf can't get to us. He stands in my place and that guilty verdict has his name against it. That punishment, that death falls on him instead of me. And this Jesus, this good shepherd, is in fact so full of life that he did die. He died a horrendous death on a cross, but he was so full of life that death itself could not contain him. He was so full of life that he it's as though he destroyed death. He died. He is alive again. He is still the good shepherd. He still leads. He still calls his sheep to follow. Jesus is the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. He leads us to where we need to get to. Now we express our belief in him by following him confidently and joyfully. That's how we express belief in this good shepherd. That's how we respond to what he has to say. And I said earlier, many of us may be tempted at times to, to see see Jesus as a hired hand. We're tempted to think of him as a hired hand. And I think particularly in a time like this, in the midst of a global pandemic, we might be tempted to ask the question, well, where is he? Is he only God when things are good? Is he still God when there are concerns about finances, about family, about friends, uh, concerns about jobs, about health? Is he still God? Or is he only God when things are good? Does he flee when the going gets tough? Well, if that is you today, I would like to encourage you. And I'd like to tell you that Jesus does not run when things get tough. He still intends to lead you exactly where you are today. And my encouragement actually to you is, I would say, let's be honest, be absolutely honest with him. I know a number of us are, are, are struggling at this time and I would say be honest, talk to him, ask him for help. Say to him, I would like to follow you confidently, 
but I need help to have confidence in you. And he is so good and so generous that he gives us confidence to follow him. So I'd just love to encourage you, if that, if that is you, be honest, talk to him, ask him to give you confidence to follow him with confidence. But for some of us, we might be tempted to, to think, well, okay, he is a shepherd. He, he, he looks after me. He provides for me. Um, he does well by me. But we may fail to see him as the good shepherd. We may think, well, look, he does a lot of good things for me. I therefore ought to obey. I ought to do what he says out of gratitude, really. We might be tempted to think, well, Jesus is, is he, 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 he's... He's constantly kind of pushing me and moving me. And I ought to be doing more. I ought to be better. Well, again, if, if that is you, if that is your perspective of Jesus, I would like to encourage you today. And I would like to remind you that he is the good shepherd. The good shepherd, in fact, leads from the front and not behind. He is not one who drives from the back, who pokes and prods and nudges. He is one who leads from the front. And the reality is, he always leads us to where we need to go. And because he always leads us to where we need to go, where is best for us, we are therefore able to follow him joyfully. And oftentimes we don't really know, we don't know what, where, where exactly Jesus is leading us in the ins and outs of day-to-day -day life. But the one thing that I do know is that he is leading us to eternal life i don't know what this next week holds i don't know what this next year holds but i do know that he is leading me to eternal life and therefore i can follow him joyfully and that that's what i would want to encourage you with today actually we can follow jesus the good shepherd with confidence and with joy and actually you no know, there's a um, in a few moments we are going to take communion together we're going to take bread and wine together and that's actually a really uh, practical way of us expressing our belief in it, expressing the fact that we, we want to follow him with confidence and with joy. So I'm, I'm just going to give you a, a few moments if you've got uh, bread, uh, or juice or wine to hand um, to, to grab them and to bring them back in. And, and what I'm going to say is um, don't take the bread and wine straight away. Um, we're going to take it all together at the same time. Okay, so as we take the bread and, and the wine, it, essentially what we're doing is we are expressing belief in Jesus. And you here today, you, you might not call yourself a follower of Jesus. You, you may have never known him as, as the good shepherd. And well, this could be the day that you begin to follow him. For those of you who, who do follow Jesus, you know him as your good shepherd. My encouragement is as we take the bread and as we take the wine, I would love to do it with a, 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 an atmosphere and a perspective of joy he has laid down his own life he has given it all for us he's given his very body represented in the bread he has given his very blood so that we can have fullness of life so as we eat and we drink we don't do it in a in a somber way we do it in a in a, a joyful celebratory way and we remember that this is not a fairy tale this this is real life jesus really gave his body he really gave his blood for us. So let's take the bread and the wine together. Lord Jesus, thank you that we have so much reason to celebrate. We have so much to be joyful for. I thank you that you are our good shepherd. I thank you that though we are sheep and we often go astray, we often walk into trouble, you are the good shepherd and you lead us to where we need to go. 
Lord, I thank you so much that you have given everything that we need. You've got us out of trouble and you've led us back into the presence of the Father. You've given your body and you've given your blood that we might be forgiven, that we might have brand new eternal life. So Lord Jesus, I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to follow you with confidence and with joy. For Lord, wherever you lead is good for us, is best for us. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, our good shepherd, for leading us. Amen.